Overnight, you will have seen, I'm sure, in the news today, the Israeli Defence Forces launched a raid on Gaza's largest hospital, the Al Shifa Hospital in Gaza City, where where they had previously um, launched a raid, you remember, a few months ago. Hundreds of displaced Palestinians have been sheltering in that hospital. The Israeli military say, and I quote, senior Hamas terrorists have regrouped inside the hospital and they've been using the site as a base for launching attacks. The Gaza Health Ministry um, challenges that and says uh, the operation is, and again I quote, a flagrant violation of international humanitarian law. And that's a good example of what I want to talk with you about now because you've got an incident, an event, something's happened. You've got different accounts of what is going on there. No journalist, independent journalist, is allowed into Gaza. Israel's not allowing independent journalists into Gaza. And we've interviewed the spokesperson for the Israeli government on that at length. But they're not allowed in. The BBC wants in. All the other organisations want in. So people pick up their phones, their smartphones, and they take pictures and they do videos and they they send out messages. And then you get some information that's coming out that can be very confusing. What's the context? What happened before that video? What happened after it? Who gets to decide whether this is an accurate take on it or that's an accurate take on it? So that's the world we're into right now. You might even say smartphones and social media have become one of the weapons of this war. And not just this war, but other kinds of wars around the world. That is certainly the claim that has been made by Yusuf al Helou, who's a British-Palestinian freelance journalist, filmmaker and analyst based in London. He's been visiting Belfast this weekend. Good to have you in the Talkback studio, Yusuf. It's my pleasure, uh, William. Thank and you. It's really, really difficult, this one. <clears throat> I mean, no matter what, pe- what happens, and we could say this of Ukraine as well, you get the same effect. People in our audience will say, who do I believe? Which media platform is telling me the truth? Well, we uh, journalists are the voice of the voiceless and it's not an easy mission to report from Gaza that has been subjected to uh, numerous Israeli large-scale offensives and now we are facing this genocide. Of course, we uh, have to seek credibility, transparency and objectivity. And as a journalist, I have a responsibility to disseminate the, the truth. And I rely on trusted sources from the, from the ground. I reported from, the, from Gaza for almost um, 15 to 20 years um, in and out. And I have uh, known many journalist colleagues on the ground. So I uh, share their updates. And uh, also, you know, we might make mistakes as human beings. And mm. as you know, the first um, uh, casualty of war is the truth. And as soon as we realize that we shared um, mistakenly uh, a video that is not verified, we take it down straight away. But also on the other side, uh, when they um, share their fake videos, um, within hours, uh, they are debunked. Uh, but uh, of course, you know, it's relentless videos coming out from the ground almost, you know, every minute. You know, we cannot cope with the huge number of videos coming from the ground. And when you said they're on the other side when they share their fake videos, who do you mean? Who's on the other side? The Israeli occupation forces. Do you regard yourself as a campaigner or as an independent objective journalist? I am a Palestinian journalist, a British Palestinian journalist. Uh, my family lived there. I lost immediate family members. So I have a moral obligation to report on what's going on, even though I'm reporting from a distance. I was there in the summer and I anticipated um, um, any um, an Israeli war on Gaza. Um, mm. But this is like no other genocide. For six months in a row, Palestinians have been killed on a daily basis. And uh, it seems that um, the international community is allowing these atrocities to happen. So, um, you know, social media is a powerful medium through which we can disseminate the, the information. It's a powerful tool. Everybody in Gaza who has got a smartphone is a citizen journalist. And we have an obligation. Even um, influencers, they have an obligation to report on to report on what's going on. But also it's not easy because uh, the power cuts, they, sometimes they uh, cannot ch- recharge their batteries. Um, they lack um, data, uh, they rely on now on eSIMs, and also it's not safe to go and report from the sites that were bombarded. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's a huge challenge, and many journalist uh, colleagues were killed and assassinated by name. 
And we, we're finding our way through this. It's not ideal, as you say, Yusuf, but many of us, many programmes and programmes I work with will have established uh, contact with people who live, individuals who live in Gaza. And over the past few months, for example, we'll receive voice notes from them or they might take a video and if you say if they've got power or they've got access to uh, the internet or whatever, they might be able to get something to us that we can then share on a BBC platform. But it's, it's not ideal. What you really want is actual journalists going in there with cameras, people who are trained to evaluate the evidence, people like you, for example, who've been working there for many years. That's what you really want, but we can't have that at the minute. There's a downside to being overwhelmed with imagery without context. Journalists not only have to uh, worry about uh, covering the stories, but they have to worry about the safety of their family members. Yes. Many of them, they uh, somehow they are hopeless now. Uh, they say, what's the point of me reporting on the Israeli crimes in Gaza? Well, my family is not safe. Why? My family is starving to death. Um, foreign journalists are not um, allowed to enter into Gaza. And uh, if you remember at the beginning of this genocide, Israeli Commission forces, they imposed a media blackout. And um, uh, those foreign journalists who were impeded with the Israeli military, they had to uh, abide by the instructions of the uh, IOF. So it's not uh, an easy for Palestinians to go and report because also they lack the protective gear. But anyway, it doesn't protect them from the, the rockets and missiles and tank shilling. Um, it's it's very difficult, very dangerous job to report from Gaza. So... I'll just give you the most up-to-date numbers that we have, and, and this is from Gaza's health ministry. They say uh, their most up-to-date number is 31,300 people have been have been killed in the Palestinian territory since October the 7th. That's just since October the 7th. Obviously, no one's pretending that this conflict began on October the 7th, but that's an extraordinary number. And the majority of them, as we know, are women and children. Um, Israel points out uh, that Hamas gunmen killed about 1,200 people in southern Israel on the 7th of October and took 253 other people hostage. Many of those hostages have died, some have been released and some are still there. But amongst all of those numbers, since we're talking about journalism, we have a frightening number of journalists who have been killed, absolutely lost, um, nearly 100 at this point by some accounts, more by other accounts in Gaza. Yeah, the total number, according um, to the uh, health ministry in Gaza, 126 journalists, uh, whether they are reporters, correspondents, uh, uh, writers, um, you know, those who work within the media and institutions and so on. Uh, I think the number of Palestinian journalists killed um, is the equivalent of journalists killed maybe in the Second World War up to now. It's a huge number. And um, uh, it seems that the Israeli side, they have no, have disregard to the loss of Palestinian um, lives. Uh, they are struggling mm. to even get paid. Uh, they cannot find the food. Um, uh, today, last night, actually, um, Al, -Jazeera, Al Jazeera correspondent, Faris Al uh, he was abducted from the inside the Shifa hospital and he was tortured, uh, tortured according to... Uh, locals. Now, for Palestinians in Gaza, including my family, it's a struggle for survival, not only because they have to face the bombs, but also because um, Israel is using uh, starvation as a weapon. And, um, you know, let's not also forget that uh, Biden himself, he's got roots, Irish roots here. And we know that great Irish people here, they suffered from famine in the late 1800. And um, it's irony that um, um, you know, these uh, war planes are dropping aid from the sky in Gaza, but at the same time, those same sites are being targeted. So the journalists, when they come and go and cover these, um, you know, incidents or attacks, they are shocked and it takes them time to recover from the trauma. So, I mean, what you've just said there is Israel is using starvation as a weapon, right? I mean, again, it's an interesting case study because Israel clearly denies that they are using starvation as a weapon. They're deliberately not, they're not deliberately trying to starve people. And they say even overnight that uh, they're sending Israeli doctors in and uh, they are trying to get aid and food in. They've been criticised for the slowness of that process, but they say that's because they're concerned that some of the aid is falling into the hands of Hamas um, militants who are taking away from the people who need the aid. I mention this only... Because even in the way that you state your analysis, there is a perspective that you are bringing, which you're entitled to, of course, which is a pro-Palestinian perspective. 
and in the way that someone else might state their analysis might have a pro-Israeli yeah. perspective in the way that they state, even in the terms that they use, the words that they use. So I'm trying to put myself in the mind of a listener or someone who is trying to make sense of it, who doesn't have a perspective on it. It's a long way away. How do they get the truth? Who is telling the truth about whether starvation is a genocidal strategy here or a horrible, horrible tragedy is unfolding as a consequence of a war that was begun um, in this most recent phase by a massacre which was genocidal in its own way on the uh, on the 7th of October. Yeah, look, a number of um, um, staff, international staff who work for a number of NGOs, they stated what they saw was shocking, uh, the extent of uh, uh, mal, uh, malnourishing, uh, dehydration of um, some patients, uh, children who need some basic food, uh, uh, maybe they need special medication. Um, you know, what's happening in Gaza is a form of collective punishment. Israel controls what goes in, what goes out, mm -hmm. uh, claiming that they withdrew the, from Gaza in 2005. But it's the dehumanization. Um, you know, Israel always plays the uh, victim card. They just uh, justify their attacks on Gaza, saying that, look, everybody was involved. Uh, they celebrated what happened on October the 7th. But as uh, many people said, and I, I repeat it again, the history did not start on October the 7th. On October the 6th, Palestinians have been suffering for 75 years of military occupation. It's not playing the victim card to point out that Hamas engaged in genocidal-type massacres on the 7th of October, is it? Look, they cannot punish the whole population. 2.5 million people are being collectively punished. If they have a problem with Hamas, they can deal with Hamas. But they seek revenge from um, the defenseless population, half of whom... Uh, in Gaza are children below the age of 18. Um, it's not justified. Um, you know, we've seen these horrific videos of children torn apart, pieces. You're talking about over 100,000 injured people, many of them with um, amputations. Uh, you're talking about thousands of orphans. You're talking about 13,000 children. Mm. So they keep bragging that, um, you know, um, and you've seen these videos of detonating entire neighborhoods. They are destroying the civic life in Gaza. They just want to send Gaza back to the Stone Age. Yeah. And they are restricting the allow, restricting the entry of AD trucks into Gaza. And you've, hear, you've heard about the flower massacres, how many people were killed. So when you appeal to the United Nations or to UNRWA or to other UN-type agencies for um, an analysis of this. There was a time, perhaps, I don't know, maybe a very long time ago, when you could appeal to the United Nations and think, well, that's like appealing to the High Court. That's an independent body, and people can say, well, if the UN says that, then that must be true. That's no longer the case in this propaganda war, is it? Because you'll hear others saying, well, UNRWA had Hamas agents within it who were part of um, October the 7th, I and mean, that's been challenged by some, but some say it's uh, confirmed now. And the United Nations is biased against um, Israel. So the United Nations is part of the propaganda war, for better or worse, isn't it? You see, uh, Israel has been trying to discredit not only journalists, but also, but, all, but also to discredit international NGOs such as UNRWA, because UNRWA represents the right of return of 6 million Palestinian refugees in the diaspora, and also 6 million Palestinians internally displaced inside Gaza West Bank. Um, the uh, accusations were debunked by UNRWA, saying that, give us a chance to investigate it. Mm -hmm. You know, you cannot just accuse UNRWA of employing those, uh, I don't know, they said at the beginning 20, then they, redu they reduced the number to 6 and so on. Um, you're talking about a, a people under occupation and um, um, they cannot justify that if somebody um, has links uh, with UNRWA, uh, they have families. Uh, I'm not uh, justifying the killing of uh, civilians in the Israeli side. I'm against the killing of any innocent people. But the Israelis are always good at uh, creating falsification and propaganda and lies and they spend millions. But, um, you know, the world doesn't believe them anymore, to be honest. You know, you cannot just justify killing civilians saying that they are, we are seeking revenge for what happening, uh, what happened in the, um, you know, October the 7th. Uh, what's happening should, must be stopped and it's allowed to happen until this moment due to the complicity and also um, international complexity. And uh, complicity, I mean. I've only got a minute left uh, with you. It's been fascinating. And incidentally, we'll, we're going to continue the conversation tomorrow with um, an Israeli journalist as well. Um, but the Irish-Palestinian connection historically is quite interesting. There are many similarities. Uh, both nations suffered uh, oppression um, by colonizers in the past. Um, uh, it's not my first time here uh, in the uh, northern uh, part of Ireland. 
I know this is a sensitive uh, terminology, Northern Ireland, Northern part of Ireland. But at the end of the day, you know, people in Ireland, they show solidarity with us uh, because it's a humanitarian uh, cause. It's not uh, because they are siding with uh, the resistance, although it's a legitimate right. But I'm grateful for the support and steadfastness of the Irish people. And as we say, our day will come. Thank you very much. Uh, really appreciate it, Yusuf. And uh, what are you doing the rest of your time? Is this your last day? You yeah, I will to London, uh, just uh, meet some uh, lovely Irish comrades and, and I'll be coming back to Ireland. Even, yeah, try and some shamrock. It's and I would like to, to thank John Harrison, the hero. All right, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Let's get the news. It's one o'clock.